Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. We're going to get into another round of questions tonight. And before we start that, I just want to mention, never forget, it doesn't matter what you've done, what sins you've committed. If you truly repent, you ask for forgiveness from Almighty God. All those sins are erased as if they never existed. Like it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if you confess your sins, then God cleanses you of all unrighteousness. So don't ever let someone tell you that you're too far gone, the sins that you've committed, you can't be forgiven. Because that's not what God's Word says, and they will surely <laughs> crap the bay if they say that. So anything you've done, it doesn't matter. Just turn your heart to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Ask for forgiveness. And those sins, like I said, they are erased. They're blotted out like they never even happened. Isaiah 43, verse 25, God even says that He is the one that blots out sins and He will not remember them anymore. That's how much they are erased. So make sure to forgive yourself and just move on and be blessed. So let's ask that word of wisdom from our Father for these questions. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your written word and for giving us this place we can come and teach Your word. We ask You to guide us through this study with Your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We just ask you to help us answer these questions exactly with the truth from your word, exactly how you said it. Thank you, and please let your will be done during this study. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. So, all right, first question. Stacy from Manitoba. What do you mean by second earth age? Well, it's the second earth age that we are in now. You can read of all three earth ages in 2 Peter chapter 3. But you see, you have to go to the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, what does it say? It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But then what about verse 2? It says that the earth was void and without form. Check out that word void and without form in your Strong's Concordance. It's tuhu va buhu, and it means a worthless, empty, undistinguishable ruin. Well, is that the way God created the earth? Of course not. He didn't create it a wreck, a ruin. And that's exactly what it says in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18. It said, God did not create the earth in vain, tuhu, but he created it to be inhabited. So what the question is, what happened that caused God to destroy that first earth age? You read it in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19, and Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. That Satan, he, his pride got lifted up in him. He used to love God, but then his pride got lifted up in him, and he rebelled against God, and he convinced a third of God's children to follow him. You see, we were all there at that time in spiritual bodies. But God wanted to give even those who followed Satan the opportunity for salvation. So he destroyed that earth age. Not the earth. It's the same earth that we're in now. But he destroyed that age and brought about a newer age. So that all people that were there, whether they followed Satan or not, all people are to be born in flesh bodies in this dispensation of flesh, which is the second earth age. And he came in the flesh as Jesus Christ to give salvation to whomsoever will. So that is what it, I mean by the second earth age, because this is the second earth age, that age of salvation. And remember, not all people followed Satan. There are people that were born in the flesh known as God's elect. Like you read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, they were chosen before the foundation of the world, meaning that they stood against Satan at that rebellion. So God chose them to come and to stand against Satan even a second time when he arrived as the false Christ. So that's what I mean by the second earth age. The first earth age was that age we were all in spiritual bodies. Satan rebelled. The second earth age we, is the one we are in now where God gives all people a chance for salvation. And the third earth age will be after the millennium, which is the eternity, which we will finally be rid of Satan and all those who follow him. And like I said, you can read of all three of those earth ages in 2 Peter chapter 3. Willie from Michigan. You know the Bible has been rewritten bunches of times, so how do you know your version isn't adding or taking away from the original one? And that's a great question, and you're absolutely right that even the King James Version, it has some bad translations. 
That's why you don't want to put your trust in the King James necessarily, but you want to put your trust in the original manuscripts of the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic. That's why God gave us tools such as the Strong's Concordance and the Companion Bible. Because with the Strong's Concordance, you can take any word in the entire Word of God and you can translate it back to the original English, English Greek, or Aramaic. Because, you, like I said, there are some bad translations even in the King James, and you sure don't want to put your trust in so, a bunch of these new translations after the King James where it's so obvious that they've been purposely changed such as in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 20. I mean, those have obviously been changed on purpose by the wicked ones. But <clears throat> you're right, it's a mistake. Some people say, oh, the King James is the only thing you need to ever look at. It's exactly right. And for the most part, it is absolutely accurate. But you have to take the time to go back and at least check out the manuscripts. And all, all anyone can do it. All you need is a strong concordance. And it is, if someone wants to be a teacher of God's word, I do think they need to take the time to be a student of the languages and to look into the manuscripts for themselves. But so that's how I know, because I don't put my trust in the King James. I always take it back to the original languages. And that's why when you hear me teaching, I'll say, I'll, I'll say like a certain word doesn't necessarily mean that because it's a bad translation. And that's not me changing the word of God. That's me correcting the translators to the original languages. And you know, in the 1611, in the original King James Bible, there's even a letter in the beginning from the translators saying, look, you check us out. Don't take our word for it. But, and like I said, that's why God gave us tools like the Companion Bible and the Strong's Concordance. So you can check out the original languages because the King James is not perfect. But the manuscripts are perfect, and you can put your absolute trust in them. Do you have to get saved by baptism? Now, I want to start out by saying absolutely everybody should be baptized. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ set the example for us in Matthew chapter 3. He was baptized. And then we have the commandment God gave in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Where it says, repent and be baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So everybody should absolutely be baptized. But just because somebody has never been baptized does not mean that they are not saved. Well, what's, what's an example you can give me on that? Well, Luke chapter 23. The malefactor, he was being crucified next to Jesus Christ. And he, he had lived a life of sin. I mean, he, he was a thief. But then he realized Jesus Christ being crucified next to him was the Son of God, that he was truly the Messiah. And then he, and then the, uh, the other thief was just mocking Christ. And then this other malefactor said, well, what are you talking about? Don't you realize this man's innocent? He said, don't you fear God and realize we're about to die? Because we've actually, we're worthy of death, but he's not worthy when he was speaking of Christ. And then that malefactor said to Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me when, when you come into your kingdom. And you know what Jesus Christ said to him? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. His soul was instantly saved. That malefactor was never baptized, but he believed on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he was saved. And another place that many people will point you to is John chapter 3, verse 5, where it says, if you are not born of water, then you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And many people think that's talking about baptism. It's not talking about baptism at all. It means that you have to be born a woman. You know, like when a woman is about to give birth, her water breaks. That's what it's talking about. It's saying you have to be born a woman to enter the kingdom of God. Well, why would it say that? Because the fallen angels refuse to be born a woman, like you read in Jude, the book of Jude and Genesis chapter 6. They refuse to be born a woman, so they're damned. They have no chance for salvation. But that's what it's talking about there in John 3, 5. You have to be born a woman. So, like I said, everybody should absolutely be baptized. I mean, you absolutely should. But just because someone is not has not been baptized, that doesn't mean they're not saved. And I hope that you would never go and say, oh, no, if they, if they weren't baptized, they're not going to heaven. I mean, what a lie. I mean, I hope that you would never let somebody say that to you like they are the judge because God is the only judge. 
So we should all be baptized, but just because someone has not been baptized before they die, that absolutely does not mean that their soul is not saved. And remember, God is the only judge, not man. God knows our, every thought that we have, man doesn't. That's why he's the only judge. In Hugo from Ecuador, clarify on the fake Christ and the fallen angels. Well, you can read of it in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. What does it say there? It says, Michael, Michael's the archangel, the chief angel. It says, Michael and his angels go to fight against Satan and his angels. And then, of course, it says Satan and his angels lose, so they're cast out of heaven. And it says Satan, that old serpent called the devil, all, all the same person, says how he's cast out to deceive the whole world. That's his plan. You see, he's coming, claiming to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming, he's not only claiming to be the Savior of Christians, but he's coming, claiming to be Savior of the entire world. He exalts himself above every god. And you can read about Satan and the fallen angels again in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, where it says that Satan will be transformed into an angel of light. And that's one of the, this is a perfect uh, example. That word uh, transform, that is not what the word is in the Greek manuscripts. The word is metiscate, matizo, and it means disguised. Transform does not get it done what it means in the manuscripts. But it, said, it says Satan will be disguised as an angel of light. And then it says, don't marvel that his ministers will be transformed or disguised as ministers of righteousness. So Satan and his fallen angels, that they're in heaven right now. They're in a, yeah, there's no other way to put it. They're in heaven just as everybody else is. But, there, but that time is going to come when the sixth trumpet's going to sound and Satan and his fallen angels are going to be cast out onto this earth. Satan claiming to be the savior of all, and the fallen angels claiming to be ministers of righteousness. They're going to be saying, oh, we are angels of God, come to bring you to the Messiah. Only there's only one problem, it's the false Messiah. And as you read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-4, through 4, what does it say? It says that, I, Paul saying, I want to talk to you about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and about our gathering together unto Him. It says, don't let any man deceive you by any spirit or word or by letter as from us that, uh, that about the coming of Jesus Christ. It says, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So it's not going to happen, the return of Christ, our gathering together unto Christ, is not going to happen until after Satan and his fallen angels arrive on this earth. And many people falsely teach, oh yeah, it's going to be mass destruction, people getting their heads cut off, nuclear war. No, that's not how it's going to be at all, it's the exact opposite. It's like it says in Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, by peace Satan will destroy many. He comes claiming to be the savior of all. And this fallen angels will claim to be angels of righteousness. So that is exactly what you need to know. And like I said, that will all happen before we are reunited with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mia in New Jersey. Will people know exactly what they are choosing to take when they take the mark of the beast? And the answer is absolutely not. What is the mark of the beast? You read it in Revelation chapter. <laughs> 13 verses 16 through 18. It says that the mark is in your right hand or in your forehead. Well, what does that mean? Well, you need to go to Revelation chapter 9 verse 4 and 5 where it says if you have the seal of God in your forehead, then, then Satan and the fallen angels can't deceive you. So what does that mean? That just simply means that you have the truth sealed in your mind. So you have one or, you have one or the other. You either have the truth sealed in your mind or you have the mark of the beast, which just means that you're deceived. It means you don't have the truth sealed in your mind. So what does that mean in your right hand? Your right hand is what you do work with. That means that you're not only deceived in your mind by the false Christ, but you're even working for him, even delivering your own loved ones up to him. That's what the mark of the beast is. It's absolutely nothing physical. And then it tells you what the number of the beast is, 666. 
Well, what does that mean? Is it, all that is is that's telling you that the sixth seal, the sixth trumpet, and the sixth vial all teach you that the false Christ is coming first. And like it says in Mark chapter 13, verse 20, it says that deception is going to be so great that if the time wasn't shortened, which is shortened to a five-month period, it says if that time wasn't shortened, even God's elect would be deceived. And like it also says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it says all people except for God's elect are going to worship the false Christ. That means many, many, many Christians are going to be worshiping him. That's why in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, they're going to go to Christ when he returns. And they're going to say, Lord, we've cast out devils in your name. We've done many wonderful works in your name. But they just got done worshiping the false one. That's why Christ will say to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. So no, people aren't going to be realizing that they're taking the mark of the beast. Because all the mark of the beast is, is to simply worship the false Christ. Many, many Christians are going to worship him because, like I said, they're taught that it's going to be mass destruction. Or they're taught they're going to rapture away all lies. So, yes, many, many people who claim to be Christian, they are going to take that mark. And like I said, it's nothing physical. And, you know, it's unbelievable that people would try to tell you that, like, it, that it's some chip in your hand or that it's some type of vaccine. I mean, that's truly the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Why would any of those things have anything to do with, with losing your salvation? What matters is who you worship. Don't let anyone ever try to tell you any of that garbage. And then try to say, oh yeah, if you, if you take some vaccine, that's going to alter your DNA. That's a bunch of lies. I mean, why, why would you listen to that? That has absolutely nothing to do with the mark of the beast. Now, would you go, would I go get some, one of those vaccines? No. There's no reason to get a coronavirus vaccine for me, in my opinion. But it sure doesn't have anything to do with the mark of the beast. So don't listen to people who are so uneducated in God's word. You stick to God's word. What matters is who you worship. So chip, anything other, anything physical, that means nothing. What matters is who you worship. So yes, many, many people will ignorantly take of the mark of the beast, simply meaning they will, they will worship the false Christ because they're going to believe that he truly is the Messiah because they've listened to a bunch of lies. So don't be deceived by the false Christ. John in New Jersey. Is the mark of the beast a physical mark that people will recognize on your body? And I, I just answer that. Of course, the answer is absolutely not. You know, Genesis, have you ever read Genesis chapter 3, verse 1? Well, what does it say there? It says that Satan is, is the most subtle living creature that there, that there ever was. He is so subtle. It's obvious to anyone that has a brain that you don't want to take some physical mark. I mean, everybody knows that. But no, Satan is the most subtle living creature. And he comes to bring deception to the world by claiming to be the Savior of all. And so many people who they all think, oh yeah, I'm never going to take that physical mark. I'm, I'm never going to take a physical mark. I'm just going to be just fine. And they're going to be the first ones to worship Satan. Because they don't realize that it is all about deception. So no, it's not going to be some physical mark that everyone can see. What does it say in Romans chapter 11 verse 4? God has reserved to himself 7,000 men who will not bow a knee to the image of Baal. That's it. God's elect. Everybody else is going to bow a knee to the false Christ. And many, many, many of them are going to be Christians. And like I said, if you're just sitting around thinking you're just fine because you're not going to receive some physical mark, you're going to be one of the very first people who are deceived. So don't listen to nonsense, but listen to God's word. Jerry from Ohio. Doesn't the book of Matthew state, do not pray in public or show act of work or show act of worship in public? For if you do, there will be no treasures waiting for you in heaven. And no, the Bible doesn't say that at all. That's not what it says at all. And that shows you exactly how people can just take the word of God and just twist it. Just twist it to make it absolutely void. And remember, that's exactly what Satan did when he tried to tempt Christ in Matthew and Luke chapter 4. Just took the word of God, he, he, quoted, he quoted Psalms 91 and just twisted it. And that's exactly what you just did. So what does it say? You're talking about Matthew chapter 6. Well, I, I just want to read it straight from the word of God. It's Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 through 7. 
Let's read the exact scripture that you're talking about that has been completely twisted just to make the meaning absolutely void. Let's find out what God has to say. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And it reads, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. That's the problem. You don't want to be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So that's how you don't get rewards waiting for you, is when you make a big, vain show of it. You're just saying prayer just so people will see you. So people think that you're so holy. You, 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 people that are trying to just... That they're trying to please people, get people to worship them, basically, instead of caring about what God thinks. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking." That's when you are doing something against God. Is when you're doing a vain repetition, just all going on and on and on, just and it, not actually trying to please God, but just trying to make men think you're so holy. That's how you're going to lose your rewards. And remember, God knows every thought that we have. God knows if you're trying to play games or not. So no, God is happy when you worship Him publicly. When you're not ashamed to say that you love God. And well, well, where can you document that, that, that it is a justified thing to pray in public? 2 Chronicles chapter 6, beginning with verse 12, where Solomon is giving the dedication to, to the temple. And Solomon gives a beautiful prayer in front of all the congregation of Israel, giving God the glory. And it made God very pleased that he did that. So no, don't let anyone ever tell you that you shouldn't worship in public or you shouldn't pray in public. Where the sin comes in is if you are only doing it to be seen of other men. I remember one time someone told me how, how a preacher came and started praying for them. And he couldn't even understand the word he was saying. Because he was just getting so religious, you know. Just, but it was all flesh. And he couldn't even understand the words that he was saying. Because he wasn't really truly trying to pray to God. He was just trying to sound so holy and religious. So yeah, a person like that's not going to have any rewards coming to him. And like it, when it says go and says to pray in your closet, that doesn't mean that you actually have to go in a closet and pray. But that just means that when you're by yourself, yeah, you pray. But like I said, it's it's not it's not a sin to pray publicly, just like Solomon did in Second Chronicles chapter six, where the sin comes in is when you're using vain repetitions, trying to get people to think you are so holy. But just do what the Holy Spirit leads you to do. It makes God so happy. When people publicly are willing to claim that they're a Christian, that they love God, but do not do it to be seen of men, that that is where the sin comes in. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your written word, and we thank you for giving us this place we can come and teach your word. We ask you as to continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit, to give us understanding of your word, not just for ourselves, but so we can share it with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, in Jesus' precious name, amen. This was recorded January the 13th, 2021 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.